everyone! Hopefully it's working and hopefully my internet is going to work today. Hopefully there are some people here. Hello Tara, nice to see you. Hopefully there's a few people that were here with me last year when we did the Pentridge tour. Fingers crossed. So we'll see if a few more people are coming. Uh, so those of you who are um, who have logged on, hopefully you know what tonight is about. My name is Shala, I work with Lantern Ghost Tours and today we're talking about the old ghosts of Melbourne. So some of the stories that I'm going to be talking about today feature on our uh, old Melbourne ghost tour. Now we do loads of different tours with Lantern. Um, fingers crossed some of you have been on some of the tours before. Fingers crossed, let me know if anyone has been on a tour, either with me or just uh, in general. Um, we do tours in, obviously, the city of Melbourne. Uh, we do tours in Pentridge Jail. Love doing those tours. If you've not been on one, where have you been? You need to come on one. And we also do tours in Altona, if you like creepy old houses. And poltergeist, people who throw things at you, then you need to come to Altona. And we also do tours in Point Cook and also Williamstown and all over the rest of Australia as well. We do some in Sydney, Gold Coast, Adelaide, you name it, we, we will probably do it. We like all the spooky stuff um, with Lantern Ghost Tours as well. Uh, let's see, who have we got here? Hello, Mariam and Mary Jane. Hello, Angel, Erica. Oh my gosh, there's so many of you. Uh, Tara asks, will I be showing you some footage of ghosts? Um, not today. You'd have to come on a tour in order for me to show you some of those pictures, I think. Um, I don't have a lot of footage, actually, from some of the ghosts in the city anyway. I've got lots from Pendridge, but the city generally has, um, I mean, if you know where to go, which hopefully I do, fingers crossed, it has a general kind of creepy vibe about it. And if you know where to go and you know how to summon the right spirits, then there are some great places um, in the city if you want to conjure conjure anything and of course we've got Halloween coming up so it's a perfect time um, if you have any dousing rods get out into the city see what you can find um, I'm a little nervous because Halloween I will be at Altona which is definitely a creepy ooky spooky kind of place to be but let's get right into it so as I mentioned before my name is Charlotte hello um, and before we get uh, before we get going, um, I do want to mention that Lantern Ghost Tours and Moorland City Library acknowledges the Wurundjeri Woi Wurrung people as the traditional custodians of the land and the waterways in the area now known as Moorland. We pay respects to the elders past, present and emerging, as well as the First Nation communities who contribute to the life of the area. Always was, always will be. Right, let's get stuck into it. Um, now, one of the first stories that I want to talk about is actually where we start our tour, which is right smack bam in the middle of, of Melbourne, opposite Flinders Street Station. And that is Young and Jackson's Pub. Now it's, we hopefully, fingers crossed, you know that it is quite a historical building. It's got some really interesting history about it. Um, the building itself was originally built for a man called John Batman, Bateman, however you want to pronounce it. I like to think of it as a man with a bat, or of course, Batman. It is Halloween after all. And he was really one of the first people to come to Melbourne. Came over from Tasmania, caused a lot of problems and a lot of trouble with um, a lot of the traditional uh, landowners, landowners, landowners of the time. Um, and he had Yoan Jackson's as his home, pretty nice home. And then it was turned into a school and then it was bought by two Irish people because of course they were Irish people. Um, and they named it Young and Jackson's Pub and it's a fantastic pub. It has a rather interesting um, object inside, um, a very, very famous lady who goes by the name of Chloe. Now I can't really show a picture of Chloe 
because she she's a little naked to saw chloe but you can have a little google and you can have a look at the picture or better still actually go to young and jackson's and you'll be able to see it there now the story with chloe potentially could explain one of the spirits that likes to hang out outside of young and jackson's and she's a lady called the lady in purple the purple lady um or the lady in the shawl also known as the lavender lady she's got a lot of names that's okay and this particular person has only ever been seen by men so ladies of the tour we can breathe it's okay just the men now of course they've probably been having a few bevies as we, as we say back home and they're sort of walking stumbling towards flinders street stations and up ahead they see this beautiful lady she's felt she's tall she's blonde she's sexy and the men think four she's a bit fit i want to go over and say hi so they strut over say hello they walk closer to her and then they get this really nice sort of smell of lavender filling their nose they get, this is gonna Right, this is going to be fantastic who is this woman closer they get towards her they realize that actually her hair is really matted her eyes are sunken there's holes in her dress in her shawl and that original smell of lavender which was so alluring has now turned putrid sort of smells a bit like your nan's vicar draw probably um and they notice that there's definitely something wrong with her she's got this huge gash all the way that goes from her ear all the way down to her armpit and at this point as any normal person would they're thinking oh gosh she needs some help so they go up to her reach their hand out say excuse me miss can i help you at which point the woman swings her head around she screams in their face of course the men fall backwards completely confused and dazed about what has actually happened by the time they stand up and gather their thoughts she's disappeared all that's left in their nose is that smell of lavender that's why she's called the lavender lady and there are a few possible explanation um, explanations as to who this lady is or even why she's there and the first one is actually to do with the smell of lavender itself people use lavender to cover up sores from um stis to put it nicely if you've got these oozing postulating things on your body of course they're probably going to whiff a little bit especially in the 1800s so they would use lavender to cover up that smell disgusting option number two opposite flinders street station actually on the other side where they're building the new um train station used to be an old morgue of course if you're over in the uh, goldfields you'd come back to melbourne uh, through flinders street station and if you are a lovely rotting dead body delicious you'd need to be in a place that's relatively cool right like a morgue um so they have this great big building on the other side and it was um built with bluestone similar to what is around pentridge keeps all of the cold air in so the bodies stay nice and cold and fresh and delicious until someone comes along and picks it up that's option number two option number three is related to our friend chloe now chloe as all sitters for paints uh, for um paintings usually are she was a real person and she was called chloe she was from persia modern day iran iraq that particular area um and she was painted by a artist in paris now she fell madly in love with this artist he however didn't really fancy poor old chloe he fancied her sister what a betrayal and you can imagine this poor 19 year old chloe we all rem remember what it's like to be 19 it was a long time ago for me as might be for a couple of other people she's completely heartbroken she's like oh my gosh what am i gonna do she's super dramatic which is why i love this lady so so much she decides she's going to reap her revenge so everybody who supports the relationship gets an invitation to a private dinner at Chloe's house. She makes this delicious food, plates all over the place, except she's poisoned the food. 
she's put rat poison actually in the food itself. So of course all these people come over and they're saying hi to a new couple and Chloe's trying to put on a brave face, probably crying all of her makeup off. Um, they all eat the food. Sorry, they're planning on eating the food. Chloe sees, of course, all of this love which is going towards this couple. She realizes that actually she's a, a, a pretty bad person. Um, so thinking, oh my gosh, how could I ever want to kill all of my friends and family? All they're here for is just for love. So she decides she's gonna eat the poisoned food and she drops dead right there, right in front of her family and her sister and her want-to-be lover, the, uh, the painting artist as well which is so dramatic, a little bit ridiculous. I kind of feel like she needs to have her own Netflix show or just like, maybe just like a mini series or something like that. Um, now that kind of sad, lovesick, lovelorn energy, I reckon has attached itself to the painting. Now, originally it actually used to be in a sort of um, makeshift version of the National Gallery of Victoria. People looked upon the painting, and if you don't know what it is, have a quick little Google, because she is super naked. She's like Game of Thrones naked. She's she's ready. She looks fantastic. Um, and people thought, oh my gosh, no, she's far too naked. We can't possibly have her in an upscale gallery. So they put the painting in a place where all naughty naked people should be, the pub. Fantastic. So, perhaps the lovesick energy from poor old Chloe has manifested itself into the lady in purple. Three possible reasons for who she is. Thankfully, for me, who goes there often, and for uh, all the men of Melbourne, she hasn't been seen probably for about ten years. So we're, we're safe for now. Fingers and eyes crossed, I reckon. Um, let me know, has anybody seen Chloe um, or has anyone seen the lady in purple? Give me a little message if you've seen. Some of you, some of you have. Good, 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 good. Fantastic. Love that. Great, great, great. Now, second story that I have. Gosh, there's so many in this city actually. If you really if you really like to hear me natter and witter on, come on a tour, um, because I talk about, gosh, all sorts of things. And another one um, of my particular favourite stories um, involves Melbourne's first serial killer. Come on the tour for that one. It's a bit long for me to tell today, but it is a stonker of a story. You will love it. Um, but whilst we were talking about Young and Jackson's, I've dug out a couple of really old, fantastic photos. Um, if you have not seen Young and Jackson's, it is directly opposite the Flinders Street Station. Now, this version of Flinders Street Station, this is really hard to, like, show on the screen so I can see what I'm doing at the same time. You can just see my nose underneath. Um, this particular um, photograph, you can see Flinders Street Station here looking absolutely glorious. And we have Young and Jackson's, oh, other side, Charlotte right over here, just on this side over there. Now, I've been extremely lucky that I get, uh, I've been a tour guide all over the world. And especially in places like Rome and London and Paris, I stand there and say, what used to be here was this wonderful building. I don't have that problem in Melbourne because everything looks exactly the same. The first ever photograph of Young and Jackson's is right here. And you can see it is pretty much exactly the same. It just doesn't have that goodness awful um, advertisement on the top. But I love that you have this little handsome carriage right over here as well. You can see two people. Um, it is just absolutely wonderful. And the Prince's, um, Prince's Bridge Hotel sign is actually still on the top there. If you look really, really closely, you'll be able to see it. Love that. So, my second story. This takes place in the 1900s, and it's a particular story um, by a, uh, it's a little girl actually. It's not the nicest story, it's a little bit grisly, but you know, that's probably what you're here for, right? Um, a lady, a lady, a little girl called Alma Tershke. Now, 
the story of Alma Tershki is still kind of up in the air. Nobody really knows um, what happened um, or, or indeed who the culprit was. Um, so we are in 1921 for this particular story. And here is little Alma Tershki. Now you can't tell from this photo, but she has really long, bright red ginger hair. She's so adorable. Look at her little ascot. So cute. Um, she's 13 years old. She's an orphan. like as an actual street, there's literally nothing on there. It's not particularly exciting. Um, it is really close to Exhibition Street, actually down one of those little um, little alleyways. And on that street used to be her uncle's butcher's shop. But let me take it just a little sidestep for a second. What used to be right there was the East Side Market. Now the East Side Market wasn't your kind of posh, Victoria, uh, Victoria market that we have now. Nobody goes there for artisanal pretzels or anything like that. You used to go to the East Side Market for ne'er dwelling and for naughty, naughty, naughtiness, which is why it's obviously my favourite place. You could go there for. Um, it's still only six o'clock. I can't go into all the details. You could go there for alcohol, for drugs, gambling. You could pick up a partner or five if you really wanted to. But one of my best ever stories, it's just so ridiculous, I absolutely love it, um, is actually in relation to um, a fella who had a funeral director's shop right on that street. And he was losing a bit of trade. People weren't dying, I don't know. So he decided he would drum up a little bit of business. He goes to the hospital and he finds a man who is definitely, definitely going to die within the next week or 10 days. So he goes to the fella and he says to the family, I will pay for your entire funeral, which was expensive at the time, if you agree to come to my director shop, lie in a coffin and wait to die. And the guy goes, eh, okay, sure, let's go for it. Um, so he's lying there in his coffin, doing his, you know, dying of tuberculosis thing. And meanwhile, the funeral director actually physically sells tickets so people can come into his shop and look at this dying man. Ridiculous, and I love it. So if that doesn't tell you everything you need to know about the East Side Market, I don't know what does. Um, so Alma Tershki goes to her uncle's uh, butcher shop, delivers a parcel of meat. Unfortunately, that was in the morning, about 11 o'clock in the morning. By 5 p.m., Alma's still not home. Grandma was worried, as you, as you would be, of course, little 13-year-old girl. So calls the police and the police are on the lookout. Who is, who has captured Alma Tershki? What has happened to her? Where has she gone? And there were five people who kept saying the same name. Go and see Colin Campbell Ross, they said. And the police are thinking, well, if five people are saying this, that's a little bit dodgy. Let's go and investigate. So they find Colin Campbell Ross. And here he is. Now, I want you to comment down below very, very quickly. What do we think? Is he a goodie? Is he a baddie? Most people when I show this picture, they go, ooh, yeah, he looks like a badun. What do we think? Yeah, some of you, maybe. <laughs> now, Colin Campbell Ross, um, of course, was picked up by the police and they went to go to his house. Rummaging around and what they find is a very small person's, a small woman's or maybe girl's cardigan on the floor and within all of the fabric and the fibers there's this very long ginger bright red hair. Now unfortunately for us in 1921 we do not have um, DNA technology which is pretty pretty uh, unfortunate really for Colin Campbell Ross. So we take it to the next best person to get identified who happens to be a chemist. You know, he just kind of goes to chemist's warehouse and goes, 
get this hair tested. Um, and the chemist kind of looks at it and goes, oh, it's about the same length, it's about the same colour, same texture. I'm going to say yes, it is Alma Turchie's hair. And that is all the police needed. Colin Campbell Ross was arrested, taken to Old Melbourne Jail, and of course he got the death sentence, hanged by the throat until dead. Now, when he was asked for his final words, he said, I am innocent and only God can judge me for my sins. There he went. Now, of course, this story kind of settled down and everyone goes, oh, OK, fantastic. We caught the killer. Awesome. Up until about 50 years ago, when there happened to be an American journalist who came to Melbourne on holiday and he goes to this photo exhibition of famous Melburnians from the past, sees the picture of Alma Tershke, where have I put it, there it is, sees the picture of Alma Tershke, reads the story underneath and he goes, hmm, interesting, I'm not too sure if it was Colin Campbell Ross. So he decided to do um, a bit of an investigation, goes to the police station and says, hey, do you have any of the evidence or any of the information from this case? And of course the police are thinking, well, even if we do, it's probably not going to be any use to you. So what's the point? But down comes the box, very dusty, opens up the lid, looks inside. Would you believe it? A hair from Alma and the hair from Colin Campbell Ross's floor is still there and it's still intact. And it's actually um, so intact, in fact, that it is testable. And we have DNA technology. Woohoo! takes it to the old laboratory, gets it tested, and what would you know? It was not a match. Alma's hair did not match the hair that was found on Colin Campbell Ross's floor. And what does that tell us? He was 99.99999% innocent. Well, it's a little bit late, unfortunately, to apologize to old Colin Campbell Ross, because he's been dead for a really, really, really long time. But thankfully, the government gave him, this was as of Tuesday the 27th of May 2008, they gave him his posthumous apology. A little bit late for poor old Colin Campbell Ross, but it's nice for his family to know that, you know, they're not related to a child murderer. So the question is, who did it? Who killed Alma? We still don't know. We still don't know. But every now and again, when we go down this street, it usually happens to pregnant women, young mothers or people who have just given birth or small, uh, or small children. As soon as they get down onto that street, this wall of smell hits them and they just kind of, you can see them looking around being really confused. And they say, hey, what's up? What are you experiencing? And they say, I can smell like cotton candy. Uh, fairy floss, sorry, as you guys call it here. I can smell fairy floss or I can smell cherries, like cherry lollies, like Haribo. Odd. Really, really strange. So when that happens, I always get out the good old-fashioned dancing rods and we see if we can talk to Alma. Every single time without fail, those rods start moving. Every single time. But it's only when people have that smell or when people have that experience. So the rods always move. It's always says Alma, you know, we can do it whichever way. We say, you know, move both of the rods to the right if you are Alma. And of course, they always go to the right. And we've had some pretty good conversations with little old Alma. She says she doesn't know who killed her. She does say that she's happy. She forgives them. And she's, she's kind of living her best spirit life, which is nice. It's nice to know that little Alma is happy. But if anyone wants to try and bust this story, please do. Um, I think, um, again, it would make a really good um, podcast. Um, and my final story, small little story, is to do with some of the opium dens that you could find in Chinatown. Chinatown has always been a really masculine place. It's where all the men came to work to send the money home. Well, of course, you've got all these gold miners that are coming back from the gold fields and they're wanting exactly five things when they come out from the gold fields. Women, food, alcohol, drugs, and finally, laundry. <laughs> five things that only one people need in the world. So thankfully they can get all of this stuff down in Chinatown. So down they go, 
bag of laundry right there into the Chinese laundry and then they kind of say can I see what's in the basement as well please so they lift up this trap door and you get this beautiful blue smoke kind of billowing um, out from the basement down they go into the opium bins and it didn't matter if you were rich or if you were poor everyone's on the same level literally in the opium dens so lie down they go pipe uh, pipe goes it's lit people didn't really know that much about opium in the 1800s and it happened quite often that people would take too much opium and conk it they would die um in these in these opium basements and of course these people don't exactly want to go to the police and say oh hey so in my opium den this person has just died soz about that um so to hide it what did they do <laughs> chop it up mince it up mince those people up and they will put them right there right in the middle of the dumplings so can you imagine just kind of going to um uh, going on at Uber Eats tonight, getting your dumplings, munching down and just kind of biting down on a toenail or maybe a tooth um, or something, maybe just like a chunky bit of eyebrow. Oh my god, it would be <laughs> absolutely awful. And we definitely know that this happened on exactly three occasions that I've been able to find. Anyway, the fact that there's just three tells me that there's probably way more than that. Um, oh, I love that story. It's just... Oh, it gives me shivers, but I, I do always have a little rummage around to my dumplings before I eat them. You know, you've got to do that once you know the stories. Um, now, that was my last story for today. Um, I'm opening up to questions. Any questions, comments, please do let me know. Um, let's have a little look. What have we got so far? Any questions from anyone? Ah, oh, we think Colin Campbell Ross has got nice eyes. People think, no, he's a baddie. His eyes are sad. His eyes were sad, you're right. Uh, someone says, did they have a body? Yes, sorry, I didn't mention that. Uh, uh, we did find Alma Tur well not we, but the police did find Alma Tursky's body. It was behind the bins. Um, she was stripped naked. It wasn't particularly obvious if she'd been interfered with um there wasn't really much in the way of um injuries on her body which was why we're still not sure how she died when we ask in the rods i've had a number of different um number of different responses a couple of times she said that she was strangled um another time she said she was hit on the back of the head so it's it's difficult it's difficult to know of course, with, without knowing exactly what happened. Who was the serial killer that I mentioned? Oh my gosh, um, I couldn't possibly tell you. You're just going to have to go on the tour instead. <laughs> um, is this usually a walking tour? Yes, it is. So uh, you can join us. We do the tour so, so often, um, especially now that everything's open up. I think we're doing our first tour on Friday with me, actually. I'm so excited. Um, we're doing a children's tour, children's child family friendly um, ghost tour, actually, on Friday. And then we're going to have another not so child friendly um, tour at 8.30. And on that tour, I get to talk a lot about naughty prostitutes doing ridiculous things which is great um Heidi asks where do you find the most paranormal activity um do you know there are two places and one of them is at the back of the Sofitel might be the back of the Sofitel I think so um which is just like the most unnecessary place but it seemed to be every single place that we went um every time we went with some kind of um devices they would always go really really high um what's it called george george street george court george parade that's the one i knew my brain would kick in eventually george parade um we also get a lot of light orbs along there as well so Come on the tour and I will teach you how to do some light orb hunting. All you need is your phone to do light orb hunting. Uh, thoughts on Ouija boards. Do they work? Are there dangers? Oh, that is a really good question. Um, I could go on for a really long time about that. Ouija boards. Um, I don't mess with Ouija boards. However, 
um, I used to run tours back home in London and um, yes, we used Ouija boards on those tours and we had some pretty, pretty gnarly results. We had um, boards talking to people who weren't even part of the actual experience, which kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies. Um, yeah, that was a little bit nasty. So I don't mess around with Ouija boards, but I, I do think it's um, a gateway that if you are going to travel through it, then you need to be careful. Okay. Um, oh, someone asked, is it a famous British serial killer? Hmm. There are some possibilities. I don't think it's a famous British serial killer, but there are some links. There are some interesting links in the tour I'll tell you. Uh, it's really, it's it's a fairly long-winded story. Um, where do we find the details of the tour? You can go to Lantern Ghost Tour, give it a quick Google, we'll come up straight away. You can click on the link that's in the comment section here or just go onto the search bar on Facebook, type in Lantern Ghost Tours. You can do the same on Instagram as well. Have you ever had a, a horrible experience with the paranormal? Yes, I have Emily. And even if I think about it, it makes me feel a little bit uncomfortable just now. Um, it was in Edinburgh. Um, I used to do tours up there as well. And if anyone has been to Edinburgh, you'll know that it's a city that's kind of built on a number of different hills. And the way that they um, <laughs> literally bridge the gap are with bridges. And so they filled in all of these bridges. They didn't just leave them open, they literally filled them in so they were all empty on the inside and people who were desperately poor destitute they would go and live in there no uh, access to fresh air no windows nothing like that so people literally lived in the pitch black in filth it was absolutely disgusting the police refused to go in and on a number of occasions people would go in and they would just die you know they lived there for a certain amount of time they don't get food or anything they died um now the tours that you can take through there they just set up candles everywhere so i'm taking my group through um talking about all of the different stories the people who lived there some of the stories of the actual people who lived there um and as i often like to do on some tours i thought eh, we'll just play a little prank on them so i turned off all of the lights um blew out the candles turned off all the torches and we just stood there in the pitch black and it was a really strange experience because you could not hear anything no wind you could just hear the sounds of people breathing which was really creepy anyway um and then turn all the lights on and there's this lady who was there with with her daughter her daughter was like 19 years old or something like that they were holding each other's hands um and so the lights go on and mommy's still like holding a hand but there's no hand there so she's like this basically so mom's just like oh my god where's my daughter daughter oh my god even thinking about it freaks me out daughter is stood uh, in the corner of this room and she's just like this up to the wall just like this and she's got this stony face and she's just kind of looking like that looking super creepy at the wall and eventually i kind of just like nudged her shoulder and you could see the lights kind of flicking on behind her eyes and she's like oh my god what just happened and we're like I don't know, you're like staring at a wall. Why don't you tell us what's happening? And she said, oh, I just felt this hand lead me over to this corner. And I'm like, well, what did the hand feel like? She goes, I don't know. It felt really cold, um, but it only had two fingers. I'm like, what? And I was like, do you mean two fingers? And she's like, it was almost like that. Like you had a thumb and you had these two fingers just here. Um, and ah, uh, that was a really awful moment. <laughs> the fact that the mom was holding this hand that was not a hand, there wasn't anyone there. And of course you got this uh, creepy moment with this woman who is led to a corner and oh, it was just really creepy. Um, Angels asked, what's the scariest thing that you've encountered? That, <laughs> that was the scariest moment. That wasn't fun. Um, but I've also had a couple of experiences in Pentridge as well. Um, there are two spirits in Pentridge that like to follow me every single time. Uh, we have a medium, they say the exact same thing. 
no, you got the spirit of this person with you. I'm like, yes, yes, I know. So if I conjure them or if I try to talk to them, I always get some kind of activity with the dousing rods, which is really quite fun. Um, does anyone else have any questions for me? Questions, comments, thoughts? Have any of you experienced any ghosty, ghosty stories, ghosty things? No. I like hearing people's stories sometimes. Because e even as a, do uh, a ghost tour guide, sometimes I kind of, I'm on the fence, but then I'm not on the fence, and then something happens, I'm like, oh my god, yes, and then I'm like, well, can I explain it? I don't know. I am a teacher and a scientist, so, yeah, there are sometimes there are things that just cannot be explained, and that always freaks me out a little bit. Okay, so I don't think we have any more questions, which is absolutely fine. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I've had a really good time just chattering and nattering away. Any other questions you can write in the comment section below once this video is posted and hopefully I'll be able to get back to you. Hopefully I'll see you on a tour really really soon. It still looks like it's pretty nice and sunny outside so go outside, get vaccinated, get tested and have a really good Halloween weekend. Thank you, bye!